Every year, the week before we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, many of you know as Easter, we have the observance of Palm Sunday. We have the observance of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem when people hailed him as the King of Kings. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One week before his crucifixion, Jesus was hailed as that king. That last week of Jesus' life was a really intense week. Jesus kept very busy throughout that final week. In fact, it was one of the busiest in his life. He worked incessantly. After coming into Jerusalem, he drove the money changers out of the temple. He taught in the temple courts day after day. Several of his most memorable parables took place there in that last week. He answered the several challenges that were brought up to him by the religious leaders trying to discredit him and disprove him. He spoke much about the coming kingdom, about his approaching death, about the second coming, the judgment, many other essential topics in that last week. That last week saw him cursing the fig tree, lamenting over Jerusalem, and holding a last supper, a Passover supper with his disciples. He saw him agonized in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was arrested. He was tried in a Jewish court. He was tried before King Herod. He was tried before Pilate. He was betrayed. He was denied. He was denounced. He was mocked. He was beaten. And finally, he was crucified. All those things took place in this one week before his death. All those events Jesus did with the full knowledge that at the end of that week he was going to die. That his life was almost over. And that knowledge did not cause Jesus to retreat from his work. He didn't take time off to prepare himself for his approaching death as, as troublesome as that death was to him. He didn't in any way slack off. Instead, he worked right up to the end. With the cross in sight, he labored because he wasn't dead yet. Over the past few weeks, we've had an opportunity to look through the sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul describing the Christian condition and using a number of phrases that seem contradictory, but, but which bring out some real insights into the Christian life for us. This morning we have another one of those phrases from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This time we're going to look at the middle of verse 10 where we come across this phrase. As punished, yet not put to death. As punished, Paul says here. And when Paul's talking about being punished here, he's not talking about civil punishment. He's not talking about Rome coming against the Christians. He's not talking about persecution here in this passage. Although those things were certainly included in that punishment, he's talking here about God's chastisement. The Greek word here comes from a root which means to discipline one's child, to train up a child. And that's the, the root of this word punish that we have here. We understand that it's in the context of God training us up through discipline. It's not man's disapproval that Paul's referring to in this passage as we've talked about for the last couple of weeks, the persecution of the church. Although God does allow us to experience persecution in our walk with him so that we might be uh, matured to a deeper walk with him. But all the hardships that God brings into our lives are for that purpose. All the things that he allows to take place are for the disciplining of us that we might be matured and better prepared for all that he has before us. God does not often allow our discipline uh, to be uh, uh, overwhelming. In fact, we're told that it's never going to be able to destroy us. But the difficulties put upon us by our enemies in the faith from time to time, uh, we realize that God only allows those things into our lives for our sake. He doesn't desire us to be crushed. He's not trying to destroy us with the hard things that come into our lives. 
He wants us to be made whole. He wants us to be perfected for his fellowship. He wants us to be ready for a place in his kingdom. God's not the author of evil. And when men perform evil to other men, when we are the brunt of the wickedness that other people have in our lives, we understand that that's not God's plan that we should suffer in that way, but God includes it in his plan. God allows it into our lives for his purpose. He is superior to the power and to the intentions of the evil men that afflict our lives. And thus he can take the worst thing that we experience in this world and he can make it into the discipline that will help us to grow. One of the most reassuring passages in God's word has to be Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Thus we don't need to respond harshly to the wrongs that other people do us because we know God can do good he can do us good even in the worst abuses that others heap on us. First Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, Not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. No matter what the intent of others is, the realization that God is working in those painful circumstances to produce in us the very best for our lives allows us to rise up above petty retaliation. We aren't looking to get even with others. We don't have to get back at the people that slight us and wrong us and abuse us and hurt us because God's using those very things for our benefit. God's using those things to bless us and therefore we don't have to get back at others. We can be gracious even towards those that seek to hurt us. Discipline is a testimony to us that we have a Father that cares about us. That we have a God who loves us enough to be involved in our lives. You know why kids test the limits so often at home? They want to see their parents care. They want to see a reaction if the parent's always indifferent to what the child does, that's far more painful than that the parent reacts with discipline to what they do. It's a testimony to the child that their parent cares enough about them to correct them, to rebuke them, to discipline them from time to time. It's a testimony to us when God allows harsh things in our lives that God cares enough to do something for us. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6 says, Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. The fact that the Lord disciplines us means that he loves us means that he cares how we turn out, that he wants the best for our lives, and he's not willing to stand back and watch us go in any kind of direction which is harmful to ourselves. He wants something good out of us. And so like a loving parent will not let their children get away with things that are going to encourage bad habits and lead them on the path to destruction, so God corrects us from time to time in our lives. Now the world doesn't understand that. When they see hardships coming down on the church, they think, ah, that's proof. They don't have a God that cares about them. Why, if that person had a God that cared about him, he wouldn't allow those awful things to happen to them. Look at them. They're going through all these afflictions. They're going through all these nightmares. They've had this person turn away from them, and they secretly gloat at the fact that this proves we don't have a loving God. But they've misinterpreted it, haven't they? The very fact that we are disciplined means that we do have a loving God. We have a God that's concerned about us enough to be involved in our lives. For those who are mature in the faith, the Lord's discipline is not to be despised because we see it as the mark of our loving Father who wants the best for us, His children. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24 says, Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Talk, talking about abuse here. 
because that happens all too often in, in homes where parents allow their children to trip up their, their anger and, and resentment against their child and they come and act in their child in a harsh way because of that. We're not talking about God being petty to get back at us here. We're talking about the loving and consistent discipline of a God who wants the best for his children. God does not hate us. God is not indifferent to us. Our God cares for us and therefore we are punished. We are as punished, our passage says, yet not put to death. You know, no matter how perilous our position might be, as long as the Lord allows us to remain in this life, we have a purpose here. God allows us to continue in this world because he has a reason for us to be in this world. So as long as we remain alive, we have a mission from God. We have a purpose to carry out. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11 says, For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. We're being crucified again and again in our lives for the purpose that we might live victorious lives for the sake of Christ. You can see that. We are punished, but not yet put under the death sentence. We are being crucified. We're being, we're being those who experience harsh things in our lives, but God still has a purpose for our lives. And as long as death has not yet come, we live according to the life that we have in the Lord. We can't get distracted by the difficulties. We can't lose sight of the purpose that God has for our lives. No matter how hard life may be treating you, you can't afford to give up. You can't afford to take a break because you're not dead yet. There is no seeking of ease there is no escapism for the follower of Christ, no retirement from his work, because as long as breath remains in us, we're to be about the task that the Lord has for us. Yes, we are punished, but we are not dead. And God's discipline is not an excuse to avoid what we're supposed to be doing for him. Looking at the context of what the Bible says about parental punishment, we find uh, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13, which says this, Do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with a rod, he will not die. <laughs> Sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? Though you strike him with a rod, he will not die. That's the way God's discipline is with us. Though we're beaten sometimes as if with a rod, though we're hurting and bruised and battered from the things that come into our lives, we're not yet dead. God has not yet brought us to the place of destruction. Again, God's discipline is not for the purpose of destroying us. It's not for the purpose of harming us. God does not want to reduce us by going through hard times. Until we die, that discipline is to prepare us for more of his work, not to bring an end to it. Too many people become discouraged by the hardships and the service that they're offering up to God. Those difficulties that are supposed to make us better equipped uh, for the work, oftentimes they allow to erect a barrier between them and the work that the Lord intends them to do. If we only labor until things become difficult, and we turn away saying, well, this must not be God's will because, you know, look at the hardships that he's sent my way. Obviously, I'm not doing what God expects me to do if he allows me to suffer in this way. If we do that, then we're missing the point of God allowing us hard times in our lives. Did Paul quit when he was continually being persecuted? When he was being beaten and jailed as he tried to serve the Lord? No. He continued to do whatever he could in whatever situation he found himself in. You know, some of the letters he wrote from the prison cells become the part of the New Testament that's most meaningful to us. The things that he sent out to encourage churches while he himself was being punished by Rome are the things which we use today to be able to know God's will in our lives. Paul didn't back down with the hard times. He pushed ahead. And God became stronger in his life 
as he continued to suffer and serve, serving with determination. I'm afraid sometimes we're too quick to seek the easy way, to turn for, from God when things get hard, to say just forget about it and throw in the cards and resume lives like our worldly neighbors. It's not enough to believe the right things. Not enough to come to a worship once a week. It's not enough to get by with the minimum, putting our toe just over the line in the Christian faith. We need perseverance. We need to soldier to the end. He who is faithful unto death, I will give the crown of life, the Lord says. We need to understand we're not yet dead. You haven't crossed the finish line. The race is still on before you. We need to labor in that race. Arthur Cudler in the Atlantic Monthly wrote, One morning I watched a couple of cowpunchers going out to bring in a wild steer from his range in the mountains. They took along one of those shaggy little gray donkeys, a burro. Now a big three-year-old steer that's been running loose on the timber is one tough customer to handle. But those cowboys had a technique. They got a rope on the steer, and then they tied him neck and neck right up close to the burrow. And when they let go, that burrow had a bad time. The steer threw him all over the place. He banged him against trees and rocks and into bushes. Time after time, they both went down. But there was one great difference between the burrow and the steer. The burrow had an idea. He wanted to go home. And no matter how often the steer threw him, every time the burrow got to his feet, he took a step closer to the corral. This went on and on. And after about a week, the burrow showed up at the ranch headquarters. Quarters. He had with him the tamest and sorriest looking steer you ever saw. See, it's not the size of the momentary bursts of spiritual strength that we carry uh, with us that are going to deliver us to the Lord someday. It's not that which is going to drag us over the finish line. It's that dogged determination to go home. It's that dogged determination to, to go in the direction that the Lord has set for our lives. And as long as the Lord gives us life, we're supposed to be on that journey. We dare not get distracted from our purpose. We should not get confused about what our purpose is here in this world. We need to invest ourselves in living the life that he has called us to live, that he would have us to live in this world. Yes, we might be punished. We might be beaten black and blue, but we haven't received the death sentence. You might feel like a donkey tethered to a belligerent and much larger steer sometimes, but if you continue to live your life with purpose, you're going to make it home. This morning, you want to make a decision to live your life with purpose. Do you want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? If you have a first-time decision to make for him this morning or if you want to renew your commitment to live for him, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing our song of invitation, Come Just As You Are. Let's stand together. <clears throat>